Welcome, everyone. I'm Professor Steve Larkin, the Pro Vice Chancellor of Indigenous Leadership here at Charles Darwin University. And I'd like to invite you all here to this very important event on the university calendar, and particularly to this venue, a venue we haven't used for some time, but uh, this year we decided to host it here rather than the Malnan Theatre. And I, I'm getting a lot of nods from the audience, and I probably, that probably means that uh, it was probably easy to find. <laughs> uh, uh, firstly, some general housekeeping. Can I just ask that you turn off your mobile phones onto silent or off? Thank you. Uh, there are toilets uh, located in the red building six, which is behind me, just past this area behind me there. And um, the student ambassadors that you met on your way can help and direct you uh, if you're lost. I'd like to begin by acknowledging this university, and indeed this event, takes place on Larrakia land. I would like to acknowledge the Larrakia people and their ancestors past and present, and ask Mr Richard Fijo to come up and perform a welcome to country. Please welcome Richard Fijo. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished guests. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge my mother, Nana Nangala Fijo, any Larrakia in attendance, the Gurindji, the Walpuri, and all of my fellow countrymen. I would like to acknowledge Mr. Jeff McMullen, Charles Darwin Chancellor, Her Honour, the Honourable Sally Thomas AC, Charles Darwin University Vice Chancellor, Professor Simon Maddox, and all the organisers of the 15th Vincent Lingiari Memorial Lecture for inviting us here this evening. My name is Richard Fijo, and I'm a Larrakia man and a direct male descendant of the Larrakia from my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather in what culture calls grandfather law. Traditionally, when people from other lands visit Aboriginal country, a welcome to country would be performed by the traditional owners, not only to acknowledge the original inhabitants, past and present, but to give those receiving the welcome to country safe passage through our lands under the guidance and protection of our ancestors. This is because Larrakia people are a welcoming people and we have always opened our doors, our minds and our hearts to others when we welcome new visitors to our lands. And we will continue to do so in the future because we want others to feel the warmth and see the beauty that our country has to offer. Our importance as Aboriginal people, our identity and our history go hand in hand when we talk about Australian identity because we can't really talk about Australian identity without giving mention to the icon that is the Aboriginal people of Australia. However, we as Aboriginal people also have our icons within our Aboriginal history and Vincent Lingiari is one of these icons. He has shown us that from little things, big things grow. He has shown us that we can be powerful. And his historical actions are reflected in our history. And it's important for us to know our history because education is knowledge and knowledge is power. When Vincent Lingiari achieved the hand back of his traditional lands, he created history for Aboriginal people because his actions led to land rights. And since history was first written from our country, Aboriginal people have fought for our land and our rights. And this is why today we have prominent Aboriginal people working in areas of health, law and other dis disciplines for all of us. And it's because of our past struggles that we can say we're achieving what so many of our elders fought for. Today the passion that they fought for is not only being echoed through our youth, but we are standing up and we are representing we are representing for ourselves, our families and our people, for our Aboriginal identity and for our Aboriginal way of life. Because what our elders have done for us in the past benefits us of today, so what we do today can benefit those of tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I welcome you to the 15th Vincent Lingiari Memorial Lecture here at Charles Darwin University, and I hope you enjoy this evening. You have come by way of Larrakia land, while you're here, you'll hear the voices of our ancestors. When you leave, you'll take the Larrakia message with you, Reverend W. Fijo. It's my honour to welcome each and every one of you here this evening. May our ancestors guide and protect you always. Thank you.
Thanks, Richard, for your warm welcome. I'd firstly like to acknowledge the presence of the Chancellor of Charles Darwin University, the Honourable Sally Thomas, Vice-Chancellor, Professor Simon Maddox, Trish Ankus, a member of our Vice-Chancellor's Indigenous Advisory Council, Gurindji people, especially the elders, Biddy Wavehill, Jimmy Wavehill, Violet Wadrill, Kathy Mills, Josie Crawshaw, Dr Sue Stanton, Eddie Kitching, Narelle Morris, Dylan Miller, Cassandra Algie, and also Larrakeet and Auntie Mima Guinness, and also other Larrakeet elders that are with us tonight. And also a warm welcome to Auntie Lorna Fijo, and also members of the Manning family. And finally, a special welcome for our guest speaker, Mr Jeff McMullen AM, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A priority for us here at the Office of Indigenous Leadership at Charles Darwin University has been and continues to be a commitment to increasing our level of engagement with the wider community. And to this end, we are building a yearly schedule of events, in addition to this annual event, to demonstrate our commitment to celebrating Indigenous academic achievement and also to commemorate the anniversary dates of significant Indigenous struggles like the 1966 walk-off. We, as an institution, plan to strengthen our community engagement through culturally relevant events that allow, every, that allow everyone to interact and to value Indigenous peoples and their cultures. And so to this end, we're extremely proud to be able to host this year's Vincent Lingari Memorial Lecture. It's an honour to have such an esteemed well, my staff said activist, but I'm going to say advocate, because I think too many white fellas put a negative value on activists. <laughs> advocate who continues to demonstrate his commitment to Indigenous causes with us at Charles Darwin University and beyond. A man whose efforts are helping Indigenous people shape a better future for the generations of Australian Indigenous people to come, Mr Jeff McMullen. But firstly, I would now like to ask Professor Simon Maddox as Vice-Chancellor to introduce and welcome our special guest. Please welcome Professor Maddox. Thank you very much, Steve. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. May I also start by acknowledging the Larrakia people and their elders, past and present, on whose traditional lands this event takes place. And can I also pay my respects to other elders that have come from other parts of Australia to be here this evening. Can I add my very warm welcome to everybody else that's here this evening and thank you for uh, uh, engaging in this very prestigious event tonight. I'm very conscious there are a number of other competing events on in Darwin, not only this time of year, particularly tonight. I myself had four other invitations to be elsewhere. There's only one of me. And like you, I chose to be at the most important event I could be at tonight and that's here. It is my very great pleasure this evening to be allowed to introduce our guest speaker, Mr Jeff McMullen. The famous walk-off of Gurindji people from Wave Hill Station in August 1966, protesting against poor pay and conditions, saw 200 protesters establish a settlement at Wati Creek, Dagaragu, and continue their strike for eight years. During this time, Vincent Lingiari toured Australia with the assistance of several workers' unions to raise awareness of the issues faced by his people and to lobby politicians for the recognition of Indigenous rights. In 1975, the Whitlam government finally negotiated a deal to return part of the traditional lands to the Gurindji people. On the 16th of August, 1975, Prime Minister Gough Whitlam presented the deeds to Vincent Lingiari in that now, and in that now very famous photograph, poured sand into his hands to symbolise the return of the country. The Gurindji campaign was an important influence on the subsequent passing of the Aboriginal Land Rights Act for the Northern Territory in 1976. Charles Darwin University is proud to host this lecture, supported by Gurindji elders, to honour Vincent Lingiari and commemorate the Wave Hill Station walk-off that he led with his Gurindji people and other groups in 1966. Tonight, we are honoured 
to have with us as guest lecturer, Jeff McMullen, a journalist, author and filmmaker for some five decades. He is probably most well known to us as a reporter for 60 Minutes and for Four Corners, and as the foremost foreign correspondent for the Australian Broadcasting Commission. Uh, sorry, Corporation, in any case. As well as serving as a director of the Australian Indigenous Mentoring Experience and the Engineering Aid Australia Indigenous Summer School Program. Jeff worked for 14 years as honorary CEO of Ian Thorpe's Fountain for Youth, establishing early learning and the literary literacy backpack program in 22 remote communities. And he was a foundation trustee of the Jimmy Little Foundation. In 2006, Jeff was awarded an Order of Australia AM for service to journalism and to efforts to raise awareness of economic, social and human rights issues in Australia and overseas, as well as for his service to charity. He is the author of A Life of Extremes, Journeys and Encounters, and has also contributed articles in black and white. Jeff was also one of the contributors to The Intervention and Anthology, which is an extraordinary document and which here at CDU we were extremely proud to host the Northern Territory launch of on Tuesday evening this week. This important book was a collaborative effort by 20 of Australia's finest writers, thinkers and activists, or is this, or is that advocates, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, alongside powerful statements from Northern Territory elders. The work brings a new dimension to one of the most unprecedented actions by a government in Australian history, the 2007 Northern Territory intervention. Ladies and gentlemen, to deliver the 15th Vincent Lingiari Memorial Lecture entitled Custodianship in the 21st Century, would you please join me in welcoming, uh, giving a very warm Darwin welcome to Mr. Jeff McMullen. Thank you. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor and Pro-Vice-Chancellor, Chancellor, and to all of you at the university for the warmth of the welcome over this past week in inviting me to be here this evening. Uh, Richard Fijo, your welcome to country uh, challenges us all to remember and honour all of the ancestors, all of the elders, those here tonight and all of those that have been part of the struggle for human rights, for land rights, for dignity through a very, very long time. I acknowledge the, the Larrakia. I also honour the Gurindji family of one of our most inspirational Australians, a man who, to me personally, is a daily inspiration to be patient and persistent and to never quit. The great power of Vincent Lingiari's story is that it teaches us all, really, how this land sings to us, how it holds us, as Aboriginal people say, how it nurtures us. And when that Gurindji leader led his people off Wave Hill, camping by the Victoria River, and then moving on to Dugarago at Wadi Creek, almost half a century ago, they knew that the land was their birthright and it was their destiny. In his wisdom, the old man also understood that a fair sharing of that natural bounty, the interconnectedness of all living things, a responsible custodianship of the land was also the key to the common good for all Australians. And so if we look at that patience, humility and dignity, Vincent Lingiari and the Gurindji struggle for land rights is a great lesson for us that it is possible to unite and inspire enough Australians to come to a legal settlement that is fair in the eyes of most reasonable people. 
This is a priceless lesson at this hour of our history when so many Australians are looking at so many different ways of recognising the rights and the rightful place of the First Peoples. Vincent Lingiari was not the slightest bit interested in the imperial designs or delusions of the Australian Constitution, a document that oozed racial superiority and is still stained with racism and discrimination. He wanted recognition that for over two centuries, unreasonably and unlawfully, his people had been dispossessed. The lesson, I suggest, at this hour of our history, with much debate about recognition and rights, is that for the well-being of the First Peoples, we need to focus on Vincent Lingiari's focus, which was national voice, recognition of the Aboriginal voice at a national level, meaningful recognition of voices that came up from the community, up from country, and a persistent, patient move towards a full acknowledgement of land rights right across this country. Our nation has wasted way too much time on empty promises of equality. We've wasted time on wedge politics between the major political parties. We've wasted time on the power plays by those great white protectors in Canberra. And we've wasted time on confrontation and divide and conquer that sets communities apart and even divides brother and brother and sister and sister. We need to see that two centuries of this failed government policy has not advanced the well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We need to think deeply and more carefully about Vincent Lingiari's conviction that the land holds us all and that it is possible to have a fair sharing of the wealth of that land and together to become mates. As a senior lawman, Vincent Lingiari was drawing, of course, on his grandfather's knowledge. He was asserting custodianship, a responsible custodial role. And like the very strongest earth science, this ancient concept of Aboriginal knowledge gives every one of us, man, woman and child, some responsibility to see that this interconnected system of life upon which not only our species is dependent, but all living things, that is custodianship. It is looking past the selfish, predatory human who takes only what he wants and seeing that the custodian is a sentient human being who sees far into the future and takes on the responsibility that the future land will be as happy and as healthy and as balanced as it is today. After wandering the world for now over 60 years, I've experienced, I think, the best and the worst of the human species. Squeezing 10 lifetimes into one, I have seen great beauty but also the horror. I am now certain, as an old man, that our species is the predator, the worst natural born killer to walk this earth and our species now threatens the interconnected living system on which all living things are dependent. After witnessing some 30 wars, after seeing the genocide in Cambodia against the Maya Kisha indigenous people in Guatemala and in that slaughterhouse of Rwanda, after seeing the man-made famines caused by war in places like Eritrea and other parts of Africa, I could see that we were not acting like custodians, like sentient human beings, 
we were behaving not only selfishly but so destructively, the worst predator to ever stalk this earth. Crisscrossing the world in almost perpetual motion for most of those last six decades because I started wandering as a child, I came to see that humans are at war with one another, but they're also at war with the earth itself. Since the end of World War II, around about when I was born, according to the British earth scientist Norman Myers, humans have devoured more raw materials than all of our ancestors combined. More raw materials than in all of previous human history. Many species, apart from humans, are now facing rapid extinction. By the end of this century, one third of all living species may be gone. So watch those birds that we hear now on the wing. 10,000 species, 7,000 of them are in drastic decline. Take a walk soon across this beautiful land and drink deep on the spirituality of this country because of 250,000 kinds of plants, about 50,000 will be gone in the next few decades. We human beings are driving this destruction. Throughout much of my life, it's been Aboriginal people who have taught me to feel and think deeply about our carelessness that damages the earth. Ernie Grant, a very old friend, the durable elder at Tully in far north Queensland, is so articulate about even minute changes to that living environment, all the very dramatic ones that we can see, that I came to see custodianship, like Vincent Lingiari understood, is akin to modern earth science. This is the same enlightened message that one of Australia's eminent earth scientists, Bill Gamage, offers us in his brilliant book, The Biggest Estate on Earth. It is a wonderful homage to indigenous custodianship of land and sea. Vincent Lingiari, in my view, above all, was a custodian. It's many years since I first walked on Gurindji country and I felt a pain there. Something was broken and something was out of balance. I wandered the ruins of the old Wavehill station with Jimmy, Jimmy Wavehill, who's here tonight, and with Gus George. They were two of those 200 that walked off behind the old man on the 23rd of August, 1966. Jimmy, who was now climbing towards eight decades of life, was a young stockman back then, and Gus was the young fellow that he carried on his shoulders. They treated us like slaves, Jimmy told me. That's why we had a meeting and told Vesties, you mob have been using us like slaves, we've had enough. It was under a midday sun and we walked in silence at Wave Hill for a time because we were all thinking about what had happened and those that had been there before us. Jimmy spied amidst the old rusted tin sheds and the broken timbers of the camp a rusted drum and his eyes were brimming with tears as he described to me how Biddy, Wavehill, Nangala, the great love of his life, when she was just a slender woman, had worked as a domestic servant up in that homestead. Biddy had to bow and scrape at that table spread with white linen. She also, Jimmy told me, with a yoke across her shoulders, had to carry drums of the station filth half a mile across the red dirt in that heat. And Jimmy felt her shame because he loved her deeply. It was on Wave Hill for the Aboriginal people a brutal life. So much was wrong, just as it is wrong today. A Vesti station man carried a 303 rifle and he barked at them that if they didn't do what they were told, he would shoot them. 
And there was reason for the fear in the air because since about 1882, when the British pastoralists had first stolen Gurindji country, right up to the 1920s, there were many killings around that area. You can read the history. Mounted Constable W.H. Wilshire described it as reprisal killings. But the truth is there was a lot of unrecorded slaughter. And at Blackfellow Creek, I studied closely two circular areas of stones. And Jimmy stood there with his hands on his hips and Gus George was trembling as he whispered to me, there were many old people, young people, even babies killed here. So I say the Wave Hill walk-off was a magnificently principled struggle for the truth. To end the denial of so much that had happened. And it was a struggle for justice. Because the Aboriginal stockmen were treated, as Jimmy said, like slaves. They were robbed of their land and yet they were virtual prisoners confined to those pastoral stations and unable to even complain about the squalor that they had to live in, just like so many remote communities today. To understand the roots of the discrimination we have seen over these past few weeks, remember that when the Aboriginal stockmen in Western Australia went on their famous Pilbara strike in 19... 46, first calling out for fair go, equal pay, the Bateman Royal Commission observed, it's pointless giving Aboriginal mob money, it's not part of their culture. That racism was so deep then that the damage that was done, the economic damage, the shaming as well, continued through many generations until today. Despite their skilled horsemanship and the hard yakker at Wave Hill, they weren't paid fair wages. They made the Vestes Empire richer by rounding up thousands of cattle, but the Aboriginal mob had to live in poverty. No sanitation, no fresh water, just thrown the head or feet of a bullock, like native title really, the scraps left over from the whitefellas. Vincent Lingiari measured his response to this oppression calmly and carefully. Forever peaceful and always patient, he knew that someday justice would come. And he made it clear through more than eight years, almost nine years of stoic resistance and struggle, that the real campaigning was for land rights, the cultural connection to country. It still is the real struggle. How revealing then to examine the words of this great man in the light of the contemporary assault on the homelands, the assault on the right to land and culture. So many people are saying, like they did in Lingiari's day, just assimilate, come in off the lands, get into town, mix it with everyone else, join the mainstream. Well, back in Lingiari's day, I recall, as a very young journalist, when the Conciliation and Arbitration Commission took up that same issue of what was a fair go, looking for equal pay, the same twisted argument about culture was used. The pastoralist said, can't pay them more money. Money isn't part of culture. It's intriguing that those who constantly want to move Aboriginal people off country, exploit them and never give them their rights, will twist the argument about culture. Culture is said to justify it, not paying people fairly, not treating them like human beings. But when Aboriginal people seriously say the connection to country and culture is their essence, this is dismissed by politicians, by many anthropologists and by so many of those public intellectuals as romantic nonsense. Once more, these assimilationists say that it's time for Aboriginal people to modernise. The phrase they use is, it's time to renovate culture and give up what our Prime Minister Tony Abbott called that lifestyle choice on the homelands. 
Why is it time to give up your connection to country, to community, to culture? The Prime Minister, several Premiers and Chief Ministers have said repeatedly it's about money. It costs too much money. To Tony Abbott and the others, we should recall how Vincent Lingiari responded to that issue. That old man understood that in renewing their life force at Dagarago, they were also reclaiming their destiny. They were connecting to who they really are, where the land holds them. It was not about money. When money was offered by the Vestes men to try to bribe the stockmen to come back, Vincent Lingiari said, you can keep your gold, we just want our land back. Vincent Lingiari guides all Aboriginal decision makers and all Australians should never forget his words because any man or woman now faced with the decision of signing a 99-year lease in exchange for giving up your communal control of that land in exchange for basic services that you're entitled to anyway should remember you can keep your gold, we just want our land back. Remember those words too when the government attempts to repatriate the Aboriginal Land Rights Act, to rework those provisions that will weaken the influence of traditional owners and the lands councils and ultimately the community. Remember Vincent Lingiari's words when the mining companies come looking for the gold, the iron ore, the bauxite, the coal or the uranium and you know they will offer a pittance of the real wealth of that land. You can keep your gold, we just want our land back. Hello, my brother. We will have that spirit here tonight, brother. Thank you. When a federal government refuses to dump nuclear waste, which of course is hazardous, for 250,000 years, but they won't put it on those large military reserves, and then goes looking for Aboriginal land in exchange for a few million dollars, ask yourself, what would Vincent Lingiari say? Seriously, can I hear you say it? You can keep your gold, we just want our land back. When the federal government and multinational companies press on with the so-called Northern Development Strategy, or they talk about turning the top end into an Asian food bowl, or if China comes knocking and wants to stake out a big agricultural business, think calmly like Vincent Lingiari would and ask, how will any of these agreements benefit the well-being of the Aboriginal people on whose land this is about to happen? Ask also in this important year, how will constitutional recognition give people national voice, like Vincent Lingiari worked for? How will constitutional recognition give them influence over decisions that have bearing on their true land rights? Most importantly, in this oppressive political season, when federal, state and territory governments are allowing the homelands to just wither and die on the vine, threatening to close many of them outright in Western Australia, remind the politicians of Vincent Lingiari's words, we just want our land back. Should we remind Tony Abbott also, who declares himself the Prime Minister for Indigenous Affairs, of what another Prime Minister said as he ran Gurindji soil through Vincent's hands in 1975? Handing back the country that was always Gurindji country, Gough Whitlam said, I want to acknowledge that we Australians have still much to do to redress the injustice and oppression that has for so long been the lot of black Australians. And then Prime Minister Whitlam said, this land will be the possession of you and your children forever. We need to remember the hopefulness of those words, the implicit trust of Gough Whitlam the Australian Prime Minister's pledge to the old man. And we need to remember and recall and renew our faith optimistically with the wisdom 
when Vincent Lingiari replied, now we can all be mates. You know the truth, and it's very confronting that so many times we've had hopeful moments like that. And this nation raises the expectations of Aboriginal people and then betrays them with political treachery. In the beginning, we took so long to even recognise the humanity of our brothers and sisters. But then we confined them forever to second-class citizenship. We stopped classing Aboriginal people as flora and fauna, but we forgot that they were human when we removed their children. Today, we have 13,900 children of the 40,000 Australian kids not living with their family. 13,900 of them are Aboriginal children. Are we still removing children from families? We treated people like those on Wave Hill Station as lowly servants. And then the governments had the audacity to haggle for decades, and they still are in Western Australia, over the wages that were stolen from them. We ignored the truth of Australia's own slavery, with 15,000 South Sea Islanders dying in the first year of their hard labour on the sugarcane plantations in Queensland. And then, with the stinging racism of the white Australia policy, we shamefully deported tens of thousands of those South Sea Islanders, showing how ingrained racism is in this country's history. So remember this, Australia, as Adam Goods dances courageously across the sporting arena and takes aim at racism. As a nation, we need to rise above racism, strive to do better as this Aboriginal champion does. It's a hopeful sign, perhaps. Once more, we see Australians around the nation now speaking up in support of Adam and all who feel that deep hurt, the damage that racism causes. But are we willing now to take action? Are we serious about changing our society in a way that lets us press on towards justice, to a fair society, acknowledging the damage that has been done and working together to heal the country? The truth is, even at perhaps the most hopeful moment, the 1967 referendum, when most of us thought we were voting for equality, equality for our brothers and sisters. The truth is the politicians failed even at that moment of hope. They never carried on the hope of that hour. They failed to lead and see that land rights were established across the country. In their timidity, timidity they failed to act and lead and take the people with them to bring the serious change this society still needs. The Australian Constitution, as a result, is still stained with racism and discrimination. There's no recognition of the Indigenous sovereignty that was never ceded and not even a signpost today on the road to a treaty or any legal compact to bind people to not just words, but legally empower the change to set things right. Instead of the trust, we haven't closed this space between us. We always see the old pattern of treachery. The government betrays the First Peoples. Every time, as I see it, that a promise is made by a government or a hand held out in friendship, in mateship and respect, our political process lapses once more into treachery. Just think about the big picture of history. It took Australia over two centuries to see past the great fiction of terra nullius. And yet, as fast as Australian governments could, they unpicked the Wick and Mabo High Court judgments and lodged appeals against so many of the native title settlements. As my old friend from Yorta Yorta country, the late and great songman Jimmy Little told me, they moved us off country to the mission and then the court said, you haven't had continuous relationship with the land, and so no native title for you. There it is, the trust and the treachery. 
So is this what we're seeing once more as Australian government deceitfully persists with attempts to move so many communities off country? The truth is, ever since ATSIC, which had quite some success in starting housing construction and moving towards building a home for everyone that calls this land home, since ATSIC was wound up in such humili humiliating fashion, all levels of government have failed to build housing, especially in remote communities. Constitutionally speaking, you could say the responsibility is shared between the federal, state, territory and local governments. But each level of government has failed that task. And this is a central failure. It explains so much of the misery, the pain that Aboriginal people have to endure today. The social engineering across Australia that purports to bring in alliances to change that poverty seems to profit those builders, but I don't see the poverty changing in the places that I spend time. Ask any of those fearful remote communities threatened with closure and they all worry that there will be hundreds and then thousands of people moving towards the fringe. If you go to Broome, Kalgoorlie, Alice Springs, Catherine and Tennant Creek, already those town camps are becoming more dangerous and more desperate. The numbers of people in the long grass are growing as well. Those white man's poisons, grog, ice and indifference, will kill these human beings unless we recall Vincent Lingiari's wisdom, the promise of what was belonging to Aboriginal people. The land was their birthright and their destiny. Like all of those who supported the Gurindji, we should stand with the people in these remote communities and join them in their fight. It's clear, if you look at this the way the old man did, that the wealth of the land should be able to take care of all of our people. On the homelands, one mining executive told me one day that only about 6% of the wealth that comes out of mining actually goes to the federal coffers. Only 6% reaches the Australian people. The Australia Institute calculates that over 80% of the mining industry is foreign owned. So clearly, if Indigenous people own the subsurface mineral rights, like Native Americans do, clearly they would have the well-being, they would have the capital to manage their own destiny. You can say, as government probably will, that it's unlikely that such a political solution would be taken up. But I say, for as long as we stare at this poverty trap, the fourth world poverty within our nation, then we need to consider the wisdom of Lingiari's advice. The wealth of the land should take care of all of the people. The truth is those remote communities are sustainable if we shared the wealth of the land. Despite the Luddite views of our Prime Minister about wind farms, all earth scientists know that the new technologies can bring the power and other change to the isolation of remote community life. Around the world, I've seen it. It's a technological revolution that is going on that is shifting access, education, health, information. It's leaving behind the old 19th century central command and it's connecting people everywhere. The Chief Minister here in the Territory has just said over the past week, that only about 20% of Northern Territory people are really connected to all of that new information. We need that. There's a place to start. Make those communities feel they are part of the nation and join them in nation building for First Nations people. To complement this technological knowledge, what we are really recognising is that it is better for this nation for people to live on country for reasons of long-term population planning, national security and sustainability. We shouldn't be think of thinking about concentrating more people in the big towns and on the edge of the larger cities when immigration flows are already directed to those areas. 
what we need to do is not shift people. We need to shift trust, investment and support and understanding to those on the homelands. In this way, decentralising the approach is in fact long time custodianship. For many decades, I've tried to present this country with evidence of where I've seen with my own eyes the change, where First Nations have progressed in health and well-being and education and jobs and housing. And let me tell you, it was not about social engineering with these neoliberal ideas of modernising and changing and pushing people into town. It was about sovereignty. It was about control of your destiny by managing the decisions about your community and your life. For serious improvements, the ones that I've witnessed on the Sami lands across Norway, Sweden and Finland, or on some of the First Nations in the United States, I have to say the progress has been remarkable since I first filmed for Four Corners there in 1973. And the research, over three decades of it, by Professor Stephen Cornell and Joe Kalt for the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development, as it's called, established emphatically that the key was sovereign control, this kind of self-determination by nations within a nation allows local people to make local decisions effectively. And then they have regional and national representation to carry that message to the government. The architects of the Northern Territory intervention clearly ignored all of the evidence I've just spoken of because the intervention crushed most local decision making. Unlawfully and in that age old pattern of speak of trust, raise our hopes, but then behave with treachery. They moved on Aboriginal people who had never been consulted, had never given their lawful prior consent, and therefore the intervention was unconstitutional, even if this court in this country, the courts, had never yet got to recognise that. In these targeted communities, people were stereotyped. They were shamed. They were punished. There was no thoughtful effort to improve life for Aboriginal children, despite John Howard's hypocrisy in declaring that he wasn't interested in constitutional niceties when the fate of little children was at stake. Just look at the evidence. The legislation itself makes no mention of children. And look at the evidence assembled by the government on what eight years of intervention have dealt to those children. A child born in that year, in 2007, will spend the first 15 years of his or her life living in an occupied territory under extraordinary social controls that are not applied to other Australians. Most of these controls are so discriminatory that, of course, the government had to treacherously remove the protection of the Racial Discrimination Act from these Aboriginal people. You know, just three times in our history has the government lifted the protection of the Racial Discrimination Act from citizens. It was always against Aboriginal people. In my lifetime, I say the Northern Territory intervention is the most disastrous policy inflicted on Aboriginal people since the stolen generations because it has produced this ongoing social catastrophe. You can measure this through the government's figures or you can just walk and talk to any family and visit any of the communities that have been oppressed by the intervention. Sickness, self-harm, suicide, incarceration, homelessness. What other measurement would our government and our federal parliament like to see that this not only failed but it is still punishing and damaging our fellow human beings. The intervention, with all its shock and awe, clearly has created a bigger social crisis. I want the country to try to understand. That is why Vincent Lingiari travelled to Canberra. He wanted the nation to stop, empty its head 
and think calmly about what was happening and how people were living. I want the country to try to understand how many families many of you here know who are losing their children to suicide. A 16-year-old girl writes a note, goes to her bedroom and hangs herself on her bedroom door. A young teacher, a mother, is broken-hearted because she thought she'd raised her boys strong enough to be able to handle all of this. And yet, her son takes his own life. An older man calls me and wants to talk and says, only my culture is keeping me walking. Only my culture, because my son has taken his life. And you know the truth, those of you in government. The truth is, in the first five years of the intervention alone, the Australian Human Rights Commission says, suicide of young Aboriginal people went up 160%. When they call my wife or I, there are no words to help or heal. They are asking to help get their family to the funeral. They might want to buy the money for the box to bury their child. But I ask our government to think about this. We are losing our children and the country is standing there and watching this. And still, the intervention continues. Across the top end, there's another crisis. And it's far worse than the one they are mesmerised by down south about homegrown terrorism. The Australian Law Commission is telling us that this country has come to a tipping point, that that poverty and pain and the crime, the incarceration rate, and this industrial prison system of building more prisons and racking and stacking them, as they call it in Western Australia. It is demanding that the whole criminal justice system change its view of what is actually happening here. Over the last 15 years, Aboriginal incarceration nationwide has gone up 57%. For the rest of the country, for non-Indigenous people, it's remained more or less the same. So we need to change that system. End the racking and stacking and the industrial treatment of prison as a business and start to invest in the communities, in the families, in the front end of this human disaster. Don't say that we're doing it already because we haven't. The truth is, again, we are miserable in this nation at building First Nations well-being. There's overwhelming evidence here and in the most hopeful Indigenous societies and in our communities that are working hard to improve life that an essential facet of well-being is in fact cultural recognition, security. All people need that. All human beings require mental balance and they need someone to let them know that you can be yourself and we are confident about you and your identity. When most of the world recognises this heritage, that this is an Aboriginal land, how tedious that our Prime Minister, some public intellectuals and quite a few media voices continue to wage a very damaging war on Aboriginal culture, a culture war. Tony Abbott almost single-handedly reignited the cultural wars. He fanned the flames by saying first that the welcome to country was out of place tokenism. And then he said that the arrival of the First Fleet was the defining moment of Australian history without any accompanying recognition of the damage, the pain of invasion, dispossession and ongoing oppression. With a whiff of terra nullius, the Prime Minister declared that the country was just bush before the British arrived. And then he added his famous insult that living on country, on the homelands, was a lifestyle choice. You may see the Prime Minister's litany of stupidity 
as just an unfortunate list of gaffes, of slips of the tongue. But I think his words betray a more troubling insensitivity. It's a failure to understand the strengths of Aboriginal people and their resilience in the longer timelines of Australian history. I'm thinking again of Bill Gamage's appraisal of what he called Aboriginal farming without fences, the custodianship that created those sweet pastures that the kangaroos would love and that the British pastoralists enjoyed too. That mosaic of fire stick farming and the management of resources over so many millennia is worthy of our admiration, not mere acknowledgement. The Aboriginal writer Bruce Pascoe, in a brilliant essay called Bread, celebrates this custodianship as Aboriginal genius. Janini Gondra and Richard Trudgeon also explain in their landmark book, Why Warriors Lie Down and Die, how culture traditionally has been the stabilising force of Aboriginal life for millennia. This message about the social value of culture is very important if we are serious about the contagion of suicide. The, the group known as Culture for Life, Culture is Life, are elders who are speaking up and saying, see the beauty and strength of culture, recognise that in the child, and you begin to show a pathway for health, for healing. We must remember this in all of the politics, the discussion of the racism that has come out of the box, or the political talk about rights and recognition. Remember that there are people who are hurting and are deeply wounded by some of the loose talk. Prime Minister, if you follow up your zealous desire to be the Prime Minister for Indigenous people with more of an effort to be aware of the strengths of their cultures, you will see the importance of land rights. You will recognise the world's most ancient land tenure. You will see the world's oldest multicultural country. You will discover the diversity of Aboriginal languages and cultural practice the different creative ways of problem solving is in fact a magnificent foundation for this modern nation in the 21st century. If you discover genuine reasons for recognition and respect, not some empty form of symbolism that someone later like you, Prime Minister, will decry as tokenism, as a nation, we will heal and move forward together. Sadly, Australia pays only lip service to one of the most important cultural rights, the right of Indigenous people to speak their languages. It's intriguing that so many of the most inspiring leaders, Vincent Lingiari, Eddie Mabo, Faith Bandler, Udguru Nunakal, to mention a few of my heroes, all recognise that one's language was the most powerful expression of cultural vitality, life source. Australia's federal, state and territory governments have very contradictory policies about language. In New South Wales, there's now support for the revival of Wiradjuri and Gamilaroi. But up here in the Northern Territory, there's been a very bizarre fashion fiddling with the policy of bilingualism for so many years as if the bureaucrats do not understand that children who speak in a language and dream in a language at home have, in fact, a gift. They have an, an intellectual gift. It's an asset, not one to be hidden away and ignored. We need to see that language is not only a right, it's an asset. In some ways, our government in Australia is guilty of cultural barbarism. The threats to evict people from the homelands, which presses on to that same destruction, to let the homelands wither and die, to defund them and move them off to town, ignores completely that for those people, country is as sacred as a cathedral or a field of graves after a war, and yet we trample on that. The West Australian government is now attempting to deregister de the heritage protection of some of the most magnificent rock art in the world. The rest of the world comes to see it. 
So on the Burrup Peninsula, the Dampier Archipelago, you can see faces looking up at you of people that have lived in ages past and of animals that are even now extinct. And this enthralling, longer story of who we are is there. Aboriginal people are holding their arms open and saying, come and see this, appreciate it, respect it, recognise it. To the rest of the world, this antiquity, an unbroken story of so many millennia, defines who we are. We are an Aboriginal land. Surely we must celebrate this together, as Vincent did, naturally and confidently, because I believe his wisdom gives us the key to the greatness that we could still walk towards. When Vincent Lingiari led his people off at Wave Hill, a lot of people said they will never last. Assimilation is too powerful. He'll change his mind. But no one really banked on that inner strength, the belief that the old man had. They didn't bank on the fierce advocacy of Dexter Daniels, the storytelling role of the novelist Frank Hardy, of the staunch union support of people like Brian Manning, Jack Phillips and Kerry Gibbs, those fellows that drove the old Bedford down from Darwin with food for the Gurindji. Brian Manning told some of us a few years ago that the secret, the real reason the Gurindji walk-off succeeded was that many people and their leaders stuck together for the long term. Manning also made a very ast astute observation. He said, it's not Lord Vesti that now has the Gurindji at his mercy. The Gurindji are at the mercy of the government and its withdrawal of funding for the homelands pushing people to the hub towns. It is time for governments across this country to abandon once and for all the poison of assimilation and forcibly trying to remove people from country. This patronising belief that government knows best for you, Aboriginal people, and for Torres Strait Islanders, has been the curse that has held us back from being not only mates, but finding that greatness as a nation. The prospects for meaningful recognition of land rights, of cultural rights, of language rights, of the right to well-being, are therefore going to require a true revolution of the Australian spirit. We all need to make this more personal. We need to close the space between us by showing we are prepared to empty our heads, be silent for a time and listen to what Aboriginal people are actually telling us across this country. Already the innate conservatism of the political classes is steering the discussion of genuine Indigenous rights towards a minimalist and almost meaningless constitutional conclusion. More tokenism is not what most Indigenous people want. Symbolism has not ended oppression or discrimination. Clearly, we do need legal clarity and we need Aboriginal empowerment, the kind Vincent Lingiari and Gough Whitlam understood. Yet some constitutional lawyers, as well as today's Prime Minister, cringe at the effort required to once and for all banish discrimination from our institutions, from our laws and even from our daily life. We hear squeals from some politicians that they don't want a Bill of Rights like our neighbours in New Zealand. They don't want to risk allowing the judiciary any of the plainly necessary checks and balances on those in the federal parliament who frequently trample the rights of indigenous people. These same constitutional conservatives have no convincing answer to the real problem. That in Australia, we have no constitutional protection of human rights. We glaringly have no protection for anyone against racial discrimination. While this shortcoming remains, Australian governments can launch a Northern Territory intervention any time they like. What an irony that the Gurindji, 
who were promised that they would be forever in control of their land, are among the communities disempowered by the interventions crushing discrimination. Our political history shows that the federal parliament will often argue that it's acting in the best interest of you Aboriginal people in the same instant that it denies the right of self-determination and imposes those harsh discriminatory policies. Only a specific non-discrimination clause inserted in the Constitution could prevent any parliament from displaying this conspicuous disregard for international human rights covenants and unjust laws whenever they feel like it. Given this pattern of discrimination, the anachronistic race powers that could allow government to take away the voting rights of a group of people, and given that deep historical stain of racism and discrimination, I say this white Australia constitution is not my constitution, and nor is it a constitution that represents you. In a submission to the Australian Government's expert panel on constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians, I propose that Australians use the referendum, if it happens, to express a 21st century concept of nationhood that includes banning all discrimination based on age, gender, race, religion, culture, disability and sexuality. A confident assertion of our determination to ban all forms of discrimination would unify Australians in all of our diversity by framing the constitutional amendment to apply not to the past, to past laws, but to the future, we would overcome the legal complexity that the lawyers are all worried about and we would move this constitution into the 21st century and move towards justice and fairness. Overwhelmingly, Indigenous people have said they want strong protection against discrimination. According to some of the opinion polls, a majority of other Australians also say they are ready to ban discrimination. So it appears to me that once more, it's the lack of courage and conviction in Canberra that has dogged this nation for two centuries that is threatening to marginalise the genuine priorities of Aboriginal people. So this underscores the importance of establishing democratically fairly, with patience and giving people time to think and speak, to find out the real views of Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders in all those small communities, people whose voices today are not being heard. The stunning simplicity in which ATSEC was swept away and the routine dismissal of advice from any of the advisory committees that have spoken in the ear to Prime Ministers for years tells us that any genuine Aboriginal oversight is going to be limited unless you have unequivocal binding legal authority that requires government to do this. So if a majority of Australians want to recognise the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we need to pay heed to what they actually think, to their voices, we need to understand their views and we do need to be far more serious about really listening. Clearly, what we are now discussing is far short of the Sami people's serious constitutional recognition by the governments of Norway, Finland and Sweden. Our national debate also consciously avoids serious consideration of the sovereign-to-sovereign -sovereign relationship of American government and Native American nations. We also seem afraid to recognise where we really stand in the eyes of the world, how seriously we are judged by the United Nations human rights authorities because of our persistent discrimination and our failure to uphold our commitment to genuine self-determination. Ultimately, Australians must recognise that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sovereignty was never ceded. There was no surrender or no treaty of resolution. And so to this extent, sovereignty exists today 
regardless of anything written in the Australian Constitution. Sovereignty is not something for other Australians to condescendingly bestow on Aboriginal people. It's there for us to recognise and for Indigenous people to reclaim and assert. No doubt others will follow the lead of those First Nations already asserting their sovereignty. For as long as we refuse to acknowledge this historical reality, and it is how the world sees us, we undermine the chances of finally establishing a good foundation for justice, a nation that is solid into the future. So look ahead constructively. In our constitution, we already have section 105A. That could be the legal framework to guide government towards binding agreements on all of the issues that are of real importance, urgency for Aboriginal people. Land rights, compensation for historic injustices, housing, health, education and employment. I believe all of this is doable, but we have to be serious about real change. I see very little of this addressed in the current constitutional discussion because so-called political realities reduce us to talk of symbolic or incremental change. All those little steps that Aboriginal people have had to endure for far too long. A significant change is required. A change in the law, a change in the constitution and a change in our hearts. We've got the wealth, but we need the will to shift empowerment to Aboriginal people. Can we forge a treaty or treaties recognising the truth of the past and legally supporting a fair and just future? Can we rise above our human flaws and doubts and in the 21st century find that full expression of custodianship that Vincent Lingiari shared with us? The old man knew that the answer to this was in the hearts of good men and women who could be mates. He outlasted all of the naysayers. He never doubted what was right, no matter how long it took him or how many tried to buy him off. He understood because he lived his value system. He led good people with him on that long road towards equality. Vincent Lingiari knew who he was and that this land held him, held him at its heart. You can keep your gold, we just want our land back. Thank you. He heard that too. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Now, I'd like to invite uh, you, the audience, uh, if you'd like to address any questions you might have to Jeff. We have a short period for questions. And for the benefit of the recording and for the audience, could you please, uh, we have circulating mics, if they're being passed around, if you could just wait for those and, until you, and uh, then ask your question. Jeff, I think you've covered everything. <laughs> we do have a question. At the back there. Thank you. It's not me. Yeah. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Um, I, I, I suppose I'd like to ask, in the context of um, the, the 67 referendum, which was kind of a start and a fail, and uh, then in later years the apology, which was also a start and a fail, how do you contextualise the comments of Michael Kirby recently in regard to the... Uh, constitutional discussion about change going on now? Well, Michael Kirby, with his wisdom, was the only voice I recall on the High Court that seemed to understand the predicament when Aboriginal people tried to challenge the oppression of the intervention here in the Northern Territory. 
So I take seriously his grim warnings and his caution about our deep conservatism. It is difficult to carry through a referendum political change unless there is genuine leadership. We see leadership from Aboriginal people at the community level and the national level, but even the attempt to bring people together is not supported by the government. It's as if the plan has been drawn up in advance for a most limited, hollow acknowledgement, which frankly already exists in the many state constitutions with a little legal clause that says none of these words can actually be used legally, non-justiciable. So uh, the former Justice Kirby's wisdom I think is enlightening. The, the truth is we needed courage in 1967 and leadership. There's been eternal courage, patience and persistence, persistence from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders. I don't see it in our political leaders. They will blame one another. They will come out belatedly and say, behind closed doors, I oppose the intervention. But they do not stand up in our democracy and put their life on the line like Vincent Lingiari did. And we do need, my brothers and sisters, to start putting our lives on the line. This is so serious. The threat to land rights, the threat to all of our children's well-being, the consequences of this ongoing oppression is wounding us as a nation. It's clear to most reasonable people. So we need more than tokenism we need to be serious about moving past discrimination and never again allow our federal parliamentarians to make shameful discriminatory legislation. The, if it takes good jurists like Michael Kirby to be the watchdogs and bite, I say give the judiciary more power. That's what frightens the constitutional conservatives. Somehow they think that what we have is fair, just and reasonable but take them to one of the communities where people are oppressed. Ask them, why has this treachery been the pattern of life now for two centuries? And they will simply say, well, we don't want to go the way of the Americans or the New Zealanders. There is no alternative offering. So we either get serious about ending discrimination and find that better part of our nature, which I believe Adam and his courage has tapped into a lot of people, business people and children in the park have stood up and said, this is not who we see ourselves as. I believe with that revolution of the spirit from the people, we can still bring our federal parliament around to seeing we are better than this. We thought we were doing it, you are correct, in 1967, but our leaders betrayed us all. We thought we were moving to equality and what we got was ongoing policies of oppression. But let's be serious. Let's have some real change. Yeah, Jack, Jack Phillips, I have um, Jeff. Uh, when they, uh, Howard started this intervention, uh, the government took over all these communities, took the leases, they got hold of all the leases, took them off the Aboriginal people. They, uh, I'd like to know if you know uh, what happened to the Gurindjis. Uh, as I understand it, the land there was held in trust for a board. Did the federal government take the lease too? If he did, then it means that Copeland Whitlam's promise that sea land forever has been broken by Howard, Gillard and Rudd. Could you tell me? I think you would need to look with a team of lawyers to understand the complexity of what has happened to title and tenure during this particular period. So much of the deceit has occurred behind closed doors, including the hatching of the intervention and how those leases were to be imposed. My understanding, though, is this. The emergency phase, the first five years, 
through that legislation gave communities no choice. So on the townships, virtual control shifted to the great white protector in Canberra. It is an echo of past ages when the chief protectors in distant offices controlled life. The changes that are happening today concern me more because amending and weakening the control of traditional owners and lands councils through a thinly disguised corporation opens up the prospect of not only subdividing communally controlled land, but in fact moving Aboriginal leadership and control out of the discussion. It's talked about by government as about private home ownership, which is part of that neoliberal development onslaught. But there is no possibility this will mean private home ownership in communities that are impoverished. It is an attempt to end the communal. All of the various patchwork of different forms of title cannot I believe that the broader community right across this nation have very little understanding of all of the things that you've articulated tonight. And I believe that if you are going to get the political will, and I mean the will of the people, uh, somehow we have to get the debate in a positive way out into the community and discuss and pull pr political pressure onto the Canberra politicians, because without the people supporting it, we will never make the necessary changes that you have articulated, which I totally agree with. I do fully agree with uh, the thrust of your question. Uh, it is a very urgent priority. And regardless of where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders, whether they're appointed leaders, traditional uh, owners, it is clear that most people support what you say. We have got no government-supported process to really allow most Australians to express their view on this. We are told by political opinion polls in that kind of analysis what a majority think. But saying a majority wants to end discrimination, you are correct, does not move a majority of people to walk with Vincent Lingiari and say, we are going to change something. So... We need a process, we need a dialogue, and Aboriginal leaders have called for that now for several decades. The reconciliation process has never closed the space between us. Those good people who work together, of course, never saw one another as us and them. They have continued to work together, but we have not yet had the listening, the careful listening. It's Lingiari's silence. It's Lingiari's art of listening that eventually wore down those that said that he would give up. I think we all have to listen. And I say we need to, in fact, see past this bipartisan agreement not to listen to Aboriginal voices. And we, the people, need to take control of our democracy again and say, on this matter, it is our nation's first priority. Our children 
and their well-being, that is our first personal responsibility. All of the other issues of well-being and wealth and law will follow if we see the humanity and take responsibility personally. And then we need to gather. We need to gather the voices like they did on the road to Dagaraka. A few hundred became thousands, then hundreds of thousands, and then people across this nation listened to the wisdom and common sense. If we can convince the country, as you suggest, that if we listen, there is a better day ahead. If we deal with this poverty within, I truly have been nowhere on earth that we're as close to greatness as in this society. It's all built on that knowledge that that old man understood. So I see the wisdom of what you're saying. We need to gather, to listen and empty our own heads of political ideas and actually see that this is about unity. Brian Manning was right. Lingiari succeeded because the leaders and a large number of people stayed unified for a long time. Not just a week or two or a little piece of symbolism or a handshake, but staying on that road. I think tonight, here in Darwin, this is a meeting where I hope we talk among ourselves and discuss those ways forward. Because at the moment, the bipartisanship in Canberra is part of the problem. They have a bipartisan plan to control and assimilate and force people off country. We need to change that kind of political thinking and to show them the evidence from First Nations that are standing strong today that have control over their destiny and to show that all of us can work together. We need to take the people with us and to leave the bitterness of political division behind us. A very wise comment. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your questions and uh, please help me once again thank our guest speaker, Jeff McMullen, AM. Thank you. In closing, I'd, I'd just like to ask you, as you make your way home tonight, just to think about the 200 protesters who continue their strike for eight long years. Not one day, not two days, not three days, not one week, not one month, but eight years. And back then, most of mainstream Australia believed that the Gurindji strikers would be easily satisfied by just improving their working conditions. But the Gurindji people had a significantly more important agenda, one that would end up leaving its mark in Australian history. They were seeking the return, the rightful return, of their traditional lands. And as Jeff said in his opening remarks, our past struggles could make it possible to unite and inspire enough Australians to move the country towards a legal settlement that is fair in the eyes of most reasonable people. I hope so. So on behalf of CDU, thank you all for attending and we look forward to seeing you all again at our next event at this time in 2016. And before I finish, I'd just like to thank Wendy Ludwig, Anne Hanning and uh, Melissa Royal and all of my staff uh, for help, uh, helping to arrange this event and particularly also because we regard this as a tier one event in Australia, uh, at CDU, uh, the Office of Media Advancement and Community Engagement and also the Office of Financial and Asset Services who also help us to organise this. So thank you and I look forward to seeing you next year and please join us for some refreshments for a period of time. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>